Aloha. Hello, everyone. My name is Pamela Spratlin. I am your moderator today for the Think Tank Hawaii program on burning issues. So I'm delighted that you are with us today. And over the next 90 minutes, we're going to be talking about burning issues all over the world. Um, I just want to say a few words about myself as the moderator. Um, and to let you know that our special focus today will be democracy and its future, its challenges. I am now a public speaker, a program convener and facilitator, but I spent 40 years in as a government uh, public servant, uh, first in the state of California and then 30 years with the state of California, so 40 overall. And uh, I had the great honor and privilege of serving in many different locations around the world. And I rose to the level of ambassador first in the Kyrgyz Republic and then in Uzbekistan. One of the things I had the great pleasure of doing during my career was to go to Hawaii for a year in 2005, six. And that's when I met uh, Jay Fidel, who is part of the Think Tech Hawaii team. I'd also like to say that I had the great honor of working um, in the State Department that was run by Secretary Madeleine Albright. And as you all know, she uh, died last week. She passed away at age 84. She was a remarkable person in our country. And she was someone who wanted to see America remain strong in its foreign policy overseas, always balancing both our interests and our values. And she's also a person to whom I owe a great debt of gratitude because she opened doors that made my leadership career possible because of a journeyman level job I had. Albright was not only a trailblazer, but she was a person who understood the price of freedom intimately from her family's flight uh, from war obsessed Europe and it left an indelible mark on her. I just, she, she was very concerned toward the end of her life that the issue of democracy might not have the same place that she thought it should in our wide array of US foreign policy issues. So I just wanna read a quote from her. She said, it would be a grave error for the United States to waver in its commitment to democracy. Historically, the Republic's claim on the global imagination has been inseparable from its identity, however imperfectly embodied, as a champion of human freedom, which remains a universal aspiration. So uh, our program is going to talk about this issue and many others as we go around the world. And you'll have a chance to see as viewers whether you think Secretary Albright uh, was correct. And what I'd like to do, you saw us uh, scroll by at the beginning, our panelists, but I want to just uh, point out how lucky we are to have each of them. Carl Baker, is a senior advisor for the Pacific Forum, a nonprofit foreign policy research institute in Honolulu that focuses on security and other issues in the Pacific. Rupmati Kandekar is the director of the Global Relations Forum. She is an expert, she has a PhD, uh, and she is here from to talk to us today about India. Um, our representative today from the Middle East is Elsa Jarhadian, who is with us from Beirut, Lebanon. We're delighted to have her. She is an expert from the project Expedite Justice Program. From Central Africa, we have Gilbert Nuagira, who is an economist in Kampala. And I had the great pleasure of speaking with uh, Gilbert earlier this week. And to talk about uh, Eastern Europe, we have Carl Ackerman, who was on the social studies faculty at the wonderful Punahou School for many years, I think almost 40 years before his retirement. And then uh, we will have a segment from a wonderful lawyer from Colombia in Latin America, Juan Pablo Telo. So um, as we get started, I would like to go first to Carl. We're going to talk first and just a few housekeeping things that I um, need to say before we get started with Carl. Um, each guest will have about five minutes to speak and share his or her main ideas. And then there'll be another five minute segment in which I will ask questions and we'll have a little bit of crosstalk. If you are in the audience and you want to have closed captions, please just press the CC button on your screen. And you can also provide questions they will be monitored in the Q&A and the chat box, and we will try to get to as many of those as we can. 
So with that, let me get started. Um, and we're going to start with Carl. Uh, Carl, I, before you get started, I just want to set uh, something up. And that is that clearly China is now a major powerhouse, a global competitor of the United States in many ways. And while the world has focused lately on China's position uh, on Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, there are many events that are coming up in the life of China's uh, uh, politi politics that are going to be very important, including in November when the Communist Party meets. And so I hope as you uh, have your first five minutes, you'll fill us in on what we can expect this year on uh, a rather momentous year in China's history. Thank you, Pamela. Uh, first, let me be clear that what I'm going to talk about is my view of what China is doing in terms of democracy as it presents it to the rest of the world. So with that, I'll begin that just ahead of President Biden's uh, Summit for Democracy in December 2021, the Chinese government published two documents that were clearly intended to challenge the premise that countries not invited were not democratic enough to be invited. First, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs published a paper titled The State of Democracy in the United States. The following day, the State Council Information Office published a white paper outlining China's distinctive conception of democracy. The documents received little attention in the Western media, and if they did, they were dismissed as Chinese propaganda. But if one accepts the proposition that Western democracy is in decline or suffering from a loss of credibility, the documents offer important insights into how China is seeking to position itself as a leader of those seeking an alternative to liberal democracy and its focus on institutional development as a measure of democratic maturity. Given the limited time available, I'll comment on three areas. First, I want to summarize a critique of US democracy offered in the foreign minister release. Second, I think it's useful to examine how the white paper on China's democracy rationalizes the Communist Party's view of democracy and represents a culmination of its efforts to provide a plausible legitimation narrative. And third, perhaps most important, is the message the white paper offers to other countries seeking an alternative to what China clearly views as an imposition of a dysfunctional version of democracy. So the criticism of the US democracy centers on three broad areas, systemic dysfunction based on money politics, elite rule, political polarization, and self-serving politicians. And I suppose anyone who watched some of the cringeworthy performances during the recent nomination hearings for Katanji Brown Jackson can probably relate to some of the criticism offered. Second, the critique highlights the anarchical pursuit of freedom and political tribalism that has led to chaotic events like the January 6th attack on the Capitol building, inept handling of COVID-19 pandemic, recurring riots, and ultimately a loss of trust in the media. And finally, the paper criticizes what it characterizes as failed attempts to export US democracy through military force and economic sanctions, which it argues have led to regional instability and human tragedies around the world. Of course, one can accuse China of overstating some of the problems associated with an open political system, but there is at least an element of truth in the criticisms offered in all three areas. And not surprisingly, the critique also provides a starting point for the white paper on China's democracy. While some might be appalled at the idea that China is a democracy, the PRC constitution includes several references to democratic institutions and article three specifically states that the state organs of the People's Republic of China apply the principle of democratic centralism, which is borrowed of course from Lenin and the Russian Bolsheviks and simply means that all democratic institutions are controlled by the communist party. As a, as a legitimation narrative, the white paper provides a detailed explanation of the evolution of China's political system and carefully connects the key elements to Confucian and Taoist philosophy regarding social order and balance. And also it connects with successful policies of previous leaders. For example, Mao Zedong's mass mobilization or mass line approach is associated with successfully translating political will into action through consultation and feedback mechanisms. Deng Xiaoping's pursuit of economic development is associated with the pursuit of common prosperity, which has lifted hundreds of millions of Chinese out of poverty. And Jiang Zemin's three represents is associated with the development of a system of promotion based on merit and the elimination of corruption. And finally, of course, Xi Jinping's consolidation of these successes into a merit-based results-oriented system 
that the white paper terms as China's whole process people's democracy is highlighted as the culmination of the process of political de democratic development. But more importantly, I think the white paper also attempts to offer advice to an external audience, those who have become disillusioned with Western democracy and seek to learn from or emulate China's experience. To begin, the paper makes clear that China is not interested in imposing its model of democracy on the rest of the world. Instead, those seeking to emulate the model should begin by examining their own civilizational and national experience to develop a system that is compatible with that history. It states that only when a democracy is rooted in a country's unique social environment can it be reliable, effective, and thrive. So the definition of democracy becomes a sovereign right and responsibility. Second, the premise of the proffered model is that democracy should be viewed as instrumental in translating political will into unified action rather than an objective end state. Therefore, democracy is a process continuum rather than a dichotomy. This, of course, makes the characterization of democracy versus autocracy a false distinction. And third, the primary focus in the, in the model is on performance and results rather than procedure. As long as policies reflect public opinion, the One political minute, leadership Carl. is responsive to people's interest and citizens can participate in political life. It can be considered a democracy regardless of the party system, election, election procedures, or mechanisms to ensure separation of power. And finally, as is typical of Chinese statements to an external audience, the white paper adds a sense of humility by concluding with platitudes about mutual respect, the importance of learning from an examination of other systems, and the need for continuous improvement. But make no mistake, these documents reflect an increasingly confident China prepared to challenge the Western conceptualization of democracy head on. Since I fear I've gone beyond my allotted time, I will conclude by saying, while this challenge to Western democracy is much more subtle than Russia's frontal assault in Ukraine, it may prove to be much more enduring and effective if not countered with a serious response. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Carl. You know, I have to say, when I first, uh, I, I did download the, the, the whole process democracy paper. And one question I have for you as somebody who's, um, who's been looking at China for a while is for whom, for whom was this paper really written? Do you think you can find 100 people in China who have any idea what whole process democracy is? And can you find, you know, 100 people in the United States who would have looked at this and, and understood the terms um, uh, that, that the Chinese are talking about. Moreover, um, this year is, is going to be a year in which this whole business of whether uh, Xi Jinping is going to be president for life is going to come up potentially in uh, November when the Communist Party has its 20th uh, uh, meeting. Um, and so I'm just wondering, can you just give us a little bit of context? That seems pretty dry and esoteric stuff. You may be right that uh, China is seeing this in, in long terms, uh, has a long-term focus here, but what does this really mean for either the Chinese person on the street or anybody else um, in the world now who really is, is taking democracy seriously? I think for the Chinese people, it's very much a, a belief in the system because primarily because of the, of the success they've had with economic development. You know, I mean, in, in some respects, this is, this is, China's understanding of the world based on a very closed information system. But when you, in conjunction with this, there was a global time survey that was conducted. And of course, you know, they claim it to be worldwide and, and very uh, objective. But in fact, you know, 70, 70 some percent of the Chinese that responded uh, agreed basically with all the points I made about the successes of, of the feedback system from the mass line, from the, from the uh, success of of economic development and, and the, the uh, success of, of Xi Jinping in consolidating these things into a merit-based system that eliminates corruption. So, you know, so, so again, you know, they've, they've very clearly have, have centrally managed this to, to make it successful in, in China. Outside, I mean, I'll leave it to the rest of the world to decide whether they accept the, the narrative that's being offered. But again, in the, in the document, they were very careful to avoid suggesting that they want to impose Chinese system on anybody else. 
They're simply saying you have to look at your own civilization, your own national history and develop. Okay, a, Carl, a Carl, we understand that. Thank you very much. We have a question in the chat about whether you can have democracy in any form if you have a leader for life. I think it's an excellent question and I can't imagine that you could do that. Well, can you, do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, this, this is of course, one of the areas that you can challenge China on is, is whether, whether Xi Jinping's decision to try to pursue a, a permanent position for himself is consistent with the principles that they talk about. So I, I, I no, I don't think you can. But I think that what, what they're arguing is that, that you have to have a centralized control to ensure that, that people understand what's important to them. In other words, it's a centrally guided democracy that ultimately is under the control of the party. Thank you very much, uh, Carl. No predictions about what may happen in November and uh, how the, the Chinese are kind of setting up uh, the future for Xi Jinping? Well, no, I mean, this is, this is one of the first contradictions that you're going to see. And of course, another thing is, is so far they've been successful with COVID-19. But if you've been watching, you know, the zero COVID policy is really being tested today in, in both Shanghai and, and in Hong Kong. So there's a lot of challenges to this system. What I'm offering to you is that this is the, this is the Chinese narrative and, and they've gotten to the point where they're confident enough to, to put this out in the international media and, and see how they get reaction. So very much of it is, is a testing of reactions from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, uh, Carl, for, uh, for that. I, it's interesting and I think we should all be aware of what the government of China is doing and what they're calling democracy. Um, and I'd also just like to note that we're very fortunate that Juan Pablo Tello has joined us. So we will not have to um, ha use a, a, a video or a past presentation. We will have him and his voice uh, here, which is terrific. But next we are going to go to India, uh, another country uh, formidable in the world. Uh, to Rupmani uh, Kandekar uh, from the Global Relations Forum. And for you, I'd just like to know, we had elections uh, in, Mod in uh, India and uh, Mr. Modi's party did very well. And I just wanna know, um, what do you have to tell us? And I'd also like, if you can, I had the chance to look at a uh, segment that you did for Think Tech Hawaii before about China and India together and the border uh, dispute that they had. That was about a year ago. And I'm just wondering, can you bring us up to date on how things uh, are going? But pr primarily focus on Mr. Modi and India's democracy. Over to you, Rupmati. Uh, aloha, Pamela, and uh, very privileged to be part of this panel and thanking Tintek Hawaii to have me on board. Um, let's say now that India is a civilization which has now progressed to being a parliamentary a democratic republic in the modern world. So we have a constitutional head of state, which is the president, and we have uh, the prime minister who is elected directly by the people of the country. So you can imagine 1.4 billion people have a say in uh, electing the press, uh, prime minister. And the prime minister is uh, the current prime minister who you want to uh, hear about, uh, Mr. Uh, prime Minister Narendra Modi is a common man. His family own a tea uh, uh, stall in Ahmedabad, Gujarat. So he, he has risen from the ranks to being the topmost uh, premier of the country. And India started out uh, the experiment of democracy after uh, independence, in which we adapted the uh, constitution from uh, multiple constitutions around the world. We just made a uh, uh, amalgamation of all and picked out the best points of it. It was a comprehensive uh, constitution. And then to develop it to suit uh, a nation which has such diversity in people, in uh, culture, you have this diverse, uh, you have diverse attitudes, you have diverse, uh, you know, uh, rebellions uh, across uh, to um, suppression after the colonization to bring this into order was a big task. So the first prime minister was rather selected rather than elected. But now Prime Minister Modi is serving his second term. After 2014, 2019, he has been elected. So uh, you can understand that attitudes towards caste, politics and religion shape uh, our nation's choice of uh, the leader. But we have a single largest uh, 
ruling party, which is the Bharatiya Janata Party (BJP), and headed by Narendra Modi. So, uh, when we say it is India is an example of democracy by the people, for the people, and of the people. It's uh, President Abraham Lincoln echoed in the most optimum way possible uh, in this uh, country. So you are freedom of choice uh, of democracy is where we have coexistence of ideas, right, right of free discussion. We have a universal adult suffrage without any discrimination between a caste, creed, religion, sex. You know, you have, um, you have uh, the people's, um, and if we go to see um, the people's, the fundamental principle of democracy, is when we evaluate security and human development. And uh, it's um, to see how the substantialization of democracy has taken place by strengthening the different parts of our government. We have an executive, we have a legislature, we have a judiciary, and we have a free media. So this brings the voice of the people to every aspect of ruling institutions. That in real terms, I feel is democracy. And to have the say of 1.4 billion is not a mean task, it's a huge. And um, if I may say that in the democratic index, we are ranking 53rd as flawed democracy along with the United States, France, Belgium, and Brazil. So I think all of us need to understand that we have a, too much of space to improve and uh, democracy always has, uh, is an evolving concept. The more the people uh, come in, uh, and uh, voice their opinion, give their representation, it is going to be more beneficial to um, the uh, ruling institutions. You can uh, ask for votes on based on uh, your poll promises, but to keep them and to keep the will of the people behind you is a, a tedious task. It's, uh, you can't trivialize the fact that uh, Mr. Narendra Modi uh, came in on the promise of development and he has fulfilled the promise. That's why he has been re-elected by a thumping majority. And uh, there have been 18 state elections which have happened in the uh, state structure of uh, India. And he has his party has won all of them. Barring a couple of states, he has won all of them. So there is a resonance of people's support for him. It doesn't stop. And Indian democracy is largely uh, commendable because of the sheer diversity of uh, religion, of caste divisions that we have. Yes. No, no two people are the same in yes. India. You can, <laughs> it, it is, and India is famous for its, uh, revered for its culture. And to have this culture inculcated in democracy and democratic institutions is really, really a, a fulfilling task. Uh, yes. For May I ask you, well, thank you for that very full-throated uh, support of democracy <laughs> in India. Um, in spite of the fact that it is, it is just remarkable that so many uh, hundreds of millions of people go to the polls in India and participate in the election. I certainly agree that's a, a commendable and amazing fact. But when you said that, Ms. that the democracy has delivered, India is a country that has really very serious challenges. And there are people, there's an opposition, and there are people who feel that democracy has not delivered for everyone in India. So what does Mr. Modi have to say to those people who feel, yes, he may have broad support, but there's an opposition and there are people who feel he is not delivering. What is he not delivering? And what does uh, India need to do to make sure that hit that that full-throated support that you just gave to democracy actually reaches everyone in terms of the quality of their lives. As I just said, that India is revered for its culture. Now, basically, the tenant of uh, Indian culture is the Hindu way of life. It is a majority, and the majority cannot be apologetic about their way of life. Uh, May I stop you, though? May I stop you, though? Democracy is about everyone. So yes, yes, it's true that there's a Hindu majority, but India is yes, a country I'm of many this. languages and many other yeah, religions. I'm coming so. to that. I'm coming okay, to that. please. Okay. Yeah, I'm coming to that. Because see, the Hindu majority and Hindu way of life is the primary way of life. You can't be apologetic of the Hindu way of life. But it has been extremely accommodated of all the minority and all the diverse religions. 
we do celebrate each other's religions we do celebrate each other's uh, festivals uh, we have uh, communities which come together we have political parties which have representation from all the communities so the single majority uh, uh, religion does not dominate it is present but it is kind of mostly omnipresent but you can uh, you can ignore it and ask them to stay back the minority and majority live in uh, harmony that is why we have been surviving 70 years of adapting modern institutions into uh, indian uh, culture if it was if there was so much of attention uh, why would mr modi uh, be uh, reelected in two general pan india elections and 18 state elections he has done more for the minority by uh, removing the triple talaq for the Muslim minority. He has bought in uh, equal inheritance rights for the minorities. So it's not like he is neglecting the minorities. He is keeping them in the, in the, uh, in the cusp of development and it is development for all that is happening. It is, if it was just concentrated on one, he would not have won another pan in the election because uh, public opinion is not forgiving. They do catch you if you make um, you know, you target somebody. It doesn't work out well. So unless and until he is taking everybody and moving across by, uh, by giving everybody a share of development, India would not have progressed to such a stage. Now, when you're giving, when there was after COVID, they have given two years of free uh, ration. Ration is uh, food supplies to all. Has there been a card which has stated that if you're of this religion, you will get the food. No, he has given it to all religions. He has given medical care to all religions. No, you're not barred from any place, any, any adult suffrage, just because of religion. Irrespective of where you come from, what you do, which, which religion you follow, you can um, be part of the democratic festival in India. Yes. And okay. Uh, well, I'm going to I'm going to have to ask. Uh, uh, we're going to have to to um, move on to another uh, topic. But before we do, I wondered if you could uh, just address the issue of China and India together, and also yes. India's position on Ukraine, if you might. Yes. Uh, now this uh, we are we are uh, antagonistic amongst each other on the show that I had with uh, Mr. J. Fider. We had discussed that how uh, we have uh, undefined India-China border and the, the crux of the agreement that we have that there are no firearms there. So we had Indian and uh, Chinese soldiers fighting fist to fist, like college boys. But uh, now uh, when India, China and Russia, India and, India and China are taking a non-aligned stand against Ukraine. See, Russia has been a strategic ally for India you cannot deny that because he, they have been supporting India more than what Ukraine did for us. Ukraine voted against the uh, 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 Indian government in the U United Nations for several issues. They have supplied our uh, enemy with arms uh, against uh, this. So it, it, would be, it would be against our policy or it would be against our interest to let go of a strategic friend who has gone through a longer time with us and uh, take side with Ukraine. So we have preferred to stay a bit of non-aligned uh, stand, but there is a definite tilt towards Russia. You cannot deny that. Yes, there is. And what's interesting about that, uh, Ramadi, is that uh, it's Ukraine that actually is trying to move in a more uh, democratic uh, direction. So while India is taking a kind of realist position about its um, it's uh, on the issue of Ukraine, it means that it's not supporting a country that is uh, smaller and weaker than Russia that is uh, trying to become uh, a democracy. I don't know if you have any comments on that before we, before we move on. Yes, I, I, I would like to make a comment on this that uh, now, right now, it's not about uh, a democracy in Ukraine, it's about ego, isn't it? It's about, uh, I, I personally feel Zelensky, as a leader, should have thought about his people first. There is always a saying that you live to fight another day. You can't, when you're fighting a losing battle, think about your people, how many people are dying. I, I would give up my ego and say, let my people live. 
and I would give in to the demands and postpone joining NATO for some time rather than seeing mass graves. It is simply not I think, leadership. I think that, it is not leadership. I think NATO's, uh, NATO is already off the table for uh, Ukraine. And I, I think that they believe that it's important to fight for your sovereignty, your independence, and your territorial integrity, which I know is important to India as well. But thank you very much um, for your you. contributions. I really uh, I do appreciate them. And now we are going to uh, go to the Middle East. The Middle East is an incredibly sensitive zone in the world and the scene of sectarian conflict for decades. There are many, many questions about uh, democracy, uh, many questions about just peace and conflict, uh, particularly for countries that are in the Muslim world. And with us today, we have Elsa uh, uh, Jarkadian, who is a consultant in Lebanon with Project Expedite Justice. And um, we uh, had talked earlier about the idea of what happened after the, the Arab Spring. And I know Lebanon has its unique uh, challenges. And I wonder also if you could just uh, bring us up to date on how things are going and how your project is trying to uh, bring more justice to a country that very badly needs it. So over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Pamela. I'm so happy to be here today. So I wanted to start with a small definition of democracy. Good. So in theory, the democracy first is a system of go <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, uh, it's a system of Western government sense. where the people. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the Western sense. Mm -hmm. So it's a system of government where the people vote for eligible members of the state through elections. So for many, this is the model that every country should follow to maintain peace, stability, equality, and so on. But the past decade has demonstrated how difficult it is to establish democracy across the North African and Middle Eastern region. Only three countries are considered democratic in this area, which are Lebanon, Israel, and Tunisia. Events such as the Arab Spring have underlined how hard it is for free elections to set up stable governments. The Middle East and North Africa witnessed years of dictatorship that have prevented the emergence of necessary institutions that can make democracy work. The Arab Spring marked a turning point in MENA history. In 2011, a revolution started in the, in the North African region that expanded in the Middle East by civilians reclaiming their fundamental human rights and the end of totalitarian regimes. So initially, the Arab Spring seemed to have reached its goals because it caused the end of some authoritarian governments, such as in Libya, Algeria, Tunisia, and Egypt. But the outcome of the end of this model brought a broader problem to the concerned countries. Embracing democracy was complex because they had never experienced such governments before. And uh, for example, in Egypt, after the fall of Hosni Mubarak's regime, elections took place and Mohamed Morsi was elected president by the civilians. But while in power, Morsi, was, Morsi issued a temporary constitutional declaration that granted him unlimited power and the power to legislate without the judicial oversight of his acts. And this led to new protests that caused the fall of Morsi's regime through a coup led by El Sisi, a now retired military officer. And because of that event, the Egyptian situation went back to the starting point. Another example is Libya, which has been divided into two different blocks, witnessing a civil war for almost a decade, same for Yemen and other neighboring countries. Another aspect that prevents democracy from prevailing is the colonization. The problem is that since those countries became independent, they never really acquired autonomy, always being influenced by the decolonizers that still have personal interests in the area. Not only that, after the decolonization of the region, power was given to religious minorities in some countries, such as in Iraq or Syria, which always caused a lot of internal instabilities. Conflicts between the different religious groups are still ongoing, each trying to reach power. In addition to the dispute different religious groups are fighting, religion per se is an important aspect to note. And that is because democracy doesn't comply with Islamic law, which most of those countries are based on. Democracy should be naturally blended within the society as imposing it will not help the situation get better. Even in Lebanon, one of the democratic countries of the region, the democratic system involves different religious groups in the political process. This type of democracy is called concordance democracy. 
it sometimes looks like a good compromise between the different uh, religious groups, but it actually generates conflict as they have different views, beliefs, and interests. Nevertheless, a part of the MENA region, the United Arab Emirates, UAE, lives in peace despite being autocratic. In fact, in 2007, the UAE launched the so-called UAE government strategy that adv uh, uh, to advance towards the highest global lifestyle standards without changing the laws and principles they believe in. Since independence, the UAE has enjoyed a significant degree of stability. So to answer your question, can MENA survive without democracy? In my opinion, it each country has its specific issue and each of them must find the most suitable government system to establish stability. That doesn't mean that I support or agree with authoritarian regimes, but I believe there are alternative solutions to solve the MENA issue. If democracy is to work in MENA, it must incorporate the full spectrum of mainstream views from Islamism to secularism. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, let me ask you, though, about Lebanon specifically, because there's a heartbreaking yes. situation there. Can you just uh, tell us a little bit about this whole conception that you've just talked about of having a wide spectrum of opinion operate uh, in a democratic system in a Middle Eastern country? Using your own country, Lebanon, uh, can you just tell us what's going on? Because it seems strife has been uh, the rule for a very long time in spite of the concordance system that you say is the mm -hmm. aspiration. So can you just talk a little bit about Lebanon and its, its particularities? And I'm also interested yes. in, in addition to um, religion and some of the, the other issues you've mentioned, are there any gen generational issues that our, our viewers should be thinking about? So uh, the problem of Lebanon starts since the, um, like the civil war that happened in the late 70s, till mid 90s. Um, the problem in Lebanon that is that since it has been decolonized in 1946, the, the French colonizers decided to divide power between Muslims and Christians, because at the time we were half Muslims and half Christians, and it, it seemed like a good idea to, to share power between those two main religions. But the problem is that as the time was moving forward, um, Muslims were, the Muslim number started to grow. So there were more Muslim civilians than Christians that were reclaiming more power because the president was supposed to be Christian and the prime minister a uh, Muslim Sunni, but those Sunnis didn't want this uh, rule anymore and they wanted to have more power. So in the 80s, they, they reached their goals after the after the civil war with, uh, um, with an agreement called Ta'if, which took some power from the, president, from the president and gave those powers to the prime minister. And already here we felt some instabilities inside the country because each religion was trying to, to have more power and they were not agreeing on several agreements that they, they had to do. Mm -hmm. So, and we're feeling those, um, like those tensions till now. Yes. And in, in 2019, a revolution started because taxes were starting to, to be very expensive and um, poverty was uh, increasing. A lot of problems were coming up and a revolution started. But um, it seems like the, the government won over this revolution because everything got worse and nothing has changed. That's very in the government. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And Can you talk uh, in, um, in May? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. In May, we will have elections. And we're hoping that the new generation will actually vote for the independent uh, parties. Okay, can you talk a little bit about your project and what it's trying to accomplish in Lebanon? So with Pro Project Expedite Justice, we are working with the Global South lawyers and uh, with a lawyer based in Colombia, another in Cambodia and me here in Lebanon. 
and um, we're trying to find figure out some ways to fight corruption and save human rights defenders with the law and implement like the the domestic laws to to save human rights defenders <laughs> okay and are you having success we just started working on it, so we're on the process. You're in the process. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Um, thank you very much. There's certainly a lot to do in um, Lebanon. Uh, I, it's hard to see the way forward there. Um, and one just question, what is the role of outside powers, especially the United States and Russia? Can you just talk a little bit about that before we move on to um, Africa? Yeah, I feel like the Cold War is still ongoing in this region because like each political parties are affiliated to either the United States or Russia. So that is another, uh, another reason why there are still conflicts in the region because as they are affiliated to two um, enemies, let's say global enemies, they, it, like it's inevitable to have um, conflicts in the region. Mm -hmm. So people feel buffeted by the, the larger geostrategic competition. Exactly. And also Lebanon, which is a really, really small country, is also stuck between those two big powers. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you also very much. And I, I certainly wish your, your project well as you um, move forward with it. Um, it's certainly inspirational that you're trying to do something like that and save human rights defenders um, in a situation that is so, so very conflict laden and where that's hard work. So thank you. Um, we're going to move next to Uganda in East Africa and talk to Gilbert Nuagira, who is um, an economist there. And um, Africa is, of course, a continent with great promise, but it's also a place of competition and challenge. China and Russia are increasingly present there, and Europe is trying to find its way um, in a post-colonial world. The United States seems to be weighing its options, and there are criticisms that the United States has been too absent, too passive not really taken the reins uh, in trying to build relations in Africa. Uh, and it, at turns, it is reticent and bullish uh, on Africa. Meanwhile, the African states themselves are taking their own futures into their own hands by many different means. You are from Uganda, uh, Gilbert, which is part of the East African Community, an intergovernmental -govern association of seven countries that was started in 1967. And when we spoke earlier, you were um, very excited about the addition of the De Democratic Republic of the Congo in this body um, when, when we spoke of its new geographic breadth. Can you just tell us a little bit about why you, uh, Uganda first, and then why you think this is uh, important and what it means for this particular part of the continent? So over to you, Gilbert. And um, again, thank you for joining us today. Yeah. Uh, aloha and uh, thank you for having me, uh, uh, um, Pamela, and uh, a huge thank you to Carl, Rubmati, and Elsa. I think there's, there's much to glean from there. Um, now, I, 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 I mentioned to Pamela that is, uh, we now have an East Coast and West Coast in East Africa now that, that, that uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Kinshasa, has, has joined um, the East African community. Of course, it's a process that will, you know, when it comes to the border controls and that will come into fruition in a couple of months, uh, it could take even a, a few years to, to materialize, but it's, it also um, uh, begs to call that, uh, that, that uh, the stakes for democracy are now much higher for a region that uh, has histories of fragility and, and conflict, both internally and, you know, externally. Uganda currently hosts coming to 1.6 million refugees. And, and most recently um, in the Southwestern part of the country, we had uh, 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 refugees fleeing from the Democratic Republic of Congo, even while the Democratic Republic of Congo was joining the East African community at almost the same instant we had refugees coming in. So that, big, that shows that there is still quite a bit of work to, to be done. And, and, and while I anchor myself in in Uganda, it, 
a, a landlocked country which which will definitely benefit from um from being a part of the community in terms of positioning itself um uh, for trade and and we're talking about a, a 300 million people market and you know you you, you uh, the drc the drc coming on makes it 300 million because the drc has 90 million people and and that is huge for the east african community and fit into the agenda of the african union uh african continental free trade area um and 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 a big question for 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 ugandans right now even as we reflect on 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 the east african community growing is is you know when we talk about the the the, the big the, the most common definition of the democracy democracy uh, of the people by the people for the people um the hu a huge question that is in uganda right now is who are the people really and and it, it comes from a place of you know years of, of conflict and and uh in, in northern uganda and you know years of also refugee hosting and 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 and, and a couple of um uh, situations that have led us to that point and um and uh very many questions are being raised and fingers are being pointed and um and one of the the the, the biggest issues that 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 popped up on the radar of, of ugandans were, were comments made by the the chief justice of the country and you know pinpointing pointing a finger at another ethnic group and and he said it's you can't you can't do that and um and, and this was after the death of of our speaker of parliament who is the third person in you know the the executive the parliament and the judiciary and 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 that caused a lot of tensions in the country and many questions were asked and i have a couple of colleagues who were walking on the streets and they were told ah because you belong to this particular group of people you you probably have money and or you you are you are the one stealing our money and that has sort of started up a deep seated um uh sense and, and question of of the people and and of who the people are and while while the current regime which is going on to 40 years uh, by the next election has been working hard to galvanize the country and is still doing so and 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 we saw yesterday we saw uh something that has not been seen uh in uganda in the recent past and and the chief justice went and apologized to the kingdom of buganda that he had offended in person which was a remarkable gesture which um for me as as a ugandan who has had an opportunity to move the different parts of the country and interact with different uh people of different ethnicities and religions and been asked several questions that are uh, that quite took me aback uh, do you earn an allowance from being part of this country or, or not and um i i see that there is there is progress but there is also we we need to be very 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 careful uh and and, and i say this because i grew up in a part of the country that had a close relationship to uh, the 1994 genocide in Rwanda, especially when issues, uh, economic uh, governance become uh, 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 regulated or um, streamlined along ethnic grounds or religious grounds. It's it's uh, it's uh, it it, be it becomes problematic and. Uh, of course, the Democratic Republic of Congo joining the East African community brings in a whole uh, the, the Francophone world into uh, uh, into the East African community. We, we will become more multi-ethnic. We'll become more multilingual, which is which is hopeful in many ways. Mm. Um, but in 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 reflecting on the fragility that has plagued the region, it's it 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 kind of raises the stakes even higher to be able to have a functioning functioning democracies within the seven countries that are in in the South African community and, and and I think the efforts are there and we you know we have a multi-party system but is it actually a functioning multi-party system so as 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 as, as Carl mentioned earlier you know the whole the, the, the whole question of the whole process democracy 
these are Uganda and the East African communities, part of the audience that, that is thinking about, okay, what does democracy actually mean for us and what would it translate to? And, um, and, 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 and I think we're going to see a couple of things changing and shifting around in the next couple of, uh, of, of years leading up to the, the, the elections in, in 2026. Yeah. Good. Thank well, you. you know, Gilbert, I wish we had more time to to talk about this because I, I think um, uh, I'd like to know a lot more about uh, how anybody in the seven countries uh, that you talked about in the uh, East African community, how do they feel democracy when you're using uh, words like fragility and we're talking about conflict? One of the common themes that crosses many of the countries uh, here uh, on this panel is corruption. So um, I don't know if you would like to just say uh, a final word about uh, just how people can actually feel democracy across the seven countries that you're talking about. Yeah, I think I think the the, the, the biggest one would be transition of, of, of power, uh, transition of governments. And I think um, uh, South Sudan in, in the north of Uganda has had trouble with that, and and we, we we see the conflict is still happening. The DRC has had its own fair share of coups and has had its you know fast um, transition. And the world is watching to see how that unfolds. Um, uh, Burundi and Rwanda have had their fair share as well. But we you 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 have a regime in in um, in Rwanda that has also been there for a while. So the question is, what will happen? What, what would the transition look like? Uh, Uganda has not had a transition for the past 37 years. And we the, the previous transitions post-independence were all very difficult transition. Uh, Tanzania has modeled what it means to have transitions and, and, and by far has had the most uh, transitions. Um, Kenya has had several transitions and had hiccups and you know elections are coming up in August in Kenya and, and, and uh, the East yes. African community members are also watching what does that mean and I think that's that's for for the community and for um, uh, investors thinking of doing business that is very important can we transition from one government to the next without having any uh, form of conflict or bloodshed can can we have relationships that across these countries that transcend uh, different uh, regimes. And, um, and we, we, are, we, are, we are seeing uh, uh, the, the Uganda-Rwanda border was closed for business for close to two years. And it's only begun opening up because, um, uh, it's only begun opening up because of you know, renewed conversation, but it's, it's still, uh, it's still you know, something that is a bit uh, uh, delicate at the moment, but it, it goes to show how the situation is unfolding here. Yeah. Yes, well, thank you so much, Gilbert. There's a lot to see there and I appreciate uh, uh, your kind of giving us a, a lens into a part of the world that very, very few of us, too few of us really know anything about. So thank you very much for that. We're now going to turn to a part of the world that's very much on uh, everyone's mind and that is with Carl Ackerman, who was for many years on the social studies faculty at Punahou School, the very famous Punahou School, which was the school of our former president. Uh, Barack Obama. He spent uh, several decades teaching there and he's now engaged in many promising community uh, endeavors. And he's going to be talking about Eastern Europe. So that's very much on our minds now. Uh, Carl, I'm going to give you the floor. And um, you've heard some people say some things about how the world perceives uh, what's going on in Ukraine. So over to you um, for your, your perspective. Thank you, Ambassador. And also, I'd also like to thank um, Mr. Fidel for allowing all of us to be part of this panel. And it, it's quite a privilege to be with such distinguished and thoughtful people in talking about democracy. Let me uh, begin by just uh, uh, forming a sort of a waiver. You know, I don't speak for Punahou School, although I still teach European history on occasion there. So, um, but I want to make sure that uh, that things are clear here. And uh, so, I have to say that at at the at the very beginning. Sure. I think, you know, um, when we're talking about Eastern Europe, we have to start with the date 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell. And you had the creation of democratic states all across um, Eastern Europe. 
I'm, I'm particularly fond of the Czech Republic because it is there that you had the first president being a playwright, uh, Vakil Havel. And, and so you begin to see the uh, democratic institutions. And I, I really want to um, quote um, Rupmati um, here because she said, <laughs> you know, when you, in India you have democratic institutions, they're not perfect. And I don't think we should see the Eastern European bloc nations as perfect, whether that be Poland or Hungary. They all have constitutions. They all have what I call representative governments. Now, what I mean, and going back to um, Elsa's wonderful beginning by defining democracy, uh, the way I would um, define democracy is going back to the American Revolution and the French revolutions, where you have constitutions, representative democracy, not, not, not direct democracy, and uh, one person, one vote. And everything is evolving as we see currently in the United States um, that we're still working towards uh, a perfected democracy. Um, I, I think the reason I began in um, 1989 with the, fall of, um, with the fall of the Berlin Wall is because in East Germany, there was a KGB agent by the name of Vladimir Putin who was there. And he had to burn a lot of documents or put them through, you know, uh, a, a shredder. Um, and um, this is the man who is now in charge of Russia. And what I'm going to maintain today is this is not a democratic war. Um, it, it is a war of one man, Vladimir Putin, against the Ukrainians. The Ukrainian, Ukrainians under um, uh, President Zelensky um, have a democratic framework with a constitutional government and one of the earliest speeches of the heroic uh, President Zelensky was talking about how every square in Ukraine now is, uh, is, the, is, is Freedom Square. And, and so uh, looking at the Ukraine, I'm not going to today um, talk about the specific military uh, maneuvers, um, et cetera, in the Ukraine. You can see that on CNN or any of our, our, our major networks in all countries. Um, but instead, what I'm going to talk about is this counter- um, position of democratic institutions in the Ukraine and the increasing uh, totalitarian framework of Vladimir Putin. And so I want to talk about what happens when you have a totalitarian state like uh, in Russia. And what you have is, as in uh, people have been talking about the United States, um, about the great law, great law, lie uh, of the former election, that the uh, former election in the United States was not fair, or things like this, you begin to have lies that overcome uh, the democratic frameworks of, of any country. And what Vladimir Putin has done is he's told two major lies that I would like to debunk today by talking about um, the history of the Ukraine. In the first place, uh, Vladimir Putin talks about, oh, you know, Ukraine is not a country, and and you know we're we're, we're one we're one uh, group of people, and it is true that ethnically and in terms of uh, cultural traditions, the Ukraine is very close to Russia. But what Vladimir Putin does not mention is that Kiev, and I'm using the old pronunciation, Kiev and Rus was the beginning of all Russian civilization. It began uh, around the city of what is now uh, Kiev, um, and there was trade between Kiev and Constantinople. And through this trade, there was a, a democratic state emerging um, in the early years. We're talking now 10th century, 11th centuries um, in Russia. And unfortunately for the people there in 1240, what I call the Pax Mongolica came to uh, Kiev. And uh, they sort of, uh, because the Mongolians were great fighters, decimated the city and people were, for, were, uh, were forced to flee north. So... The notion that there is no original, you know, Ukraine um, is nonsense. And um, the Ukraine has been there actually longer than the Muscovites and the Russians later on. So that's one uh, historical thing I wanted to uh, make sure that everyone knew. Mm -hmm. The second thing talks about the Ukraine not being a state because of the of no sort of historical focus um, on anything in the Ukraine. And, and this is is really um, a crazy. And. Um, as an aside, I want to go back to something that Gilbert said, and he was talking about the problems with democracy in, relations, in relationship to refugees. So in the Ukraine right now, um, there have been about four or five million now refugees, and the other Eastern European countries have taken them in, Poland alone with two million people. I'm going to suggest that it is the willingness and the ability 
of Republican Democratic states to do this and to honor the great and heroic nature of the Ukrainian uh, people. Um, and so that part of, I think, the Republican Democratic state is to be accepting uh, of a variety of ideas. Now, uh, I'm going to take everyone back into the 19th century. And this is, again, okay. the bond. You've got about a minute to do that, Carl. Okay, okay. well, I'm going to do it fast then. Um, <laughs> Taras Yevchenko, where there's a, um, a, a statue to him in DuPont Circle, not too far from um, where the ambassador lives, um, was a great 19th century poet. And he, he's the origin of all Russian literature. This is his poem. He's fighting for uh, the Ukraine in the 19th century. When I die, let me rest, let me lie amidst Ukraine's broad steps. Let me see the endless fields and steep slopes I hold so dear. Let me hear the Dnieper's great roar. And when the blood of Ukraine foes flows into the blue waters of the sea, that's when I'll forget the fields and hills and live it all and pray to God. Until then, I know no God, so bury me, rise up and break your chains. Water your freedom with the blood of oppressors and then remember me with gentle whispers and kind words in the great family of the newly free. In the 19th century, you already had a Ukrainian movement for independence. It continues today. And I'll add one historical aside that I think all will like. This man, Taras Shevchenko, was a serf for 24 years, beginning his life. And he was a great poet, a man of literature, but he also was a great painter. And I will leave you with this to talk about the internationalism of the Ukrainian movement. He also painted a portrait of Ira Aldridge, the great 19th century African-American um, gentleman who fought for the freedom of slavery um, in, in the United States. Yes, and was an artist too. So yeah, very interesting. Thank you very much, uh, Carl, for that. Um, I think it's everybody has, I think, a great deal of respect for the bravery of the uh, Ukrainians, even though there are many different opinions, if, as we've heard from Rukmati and others, about, um, about their cause. But um, it, we really seem to be having a world that is dividing, fragmenting in many, many different directions. But Carl, thank you very much for articulating um, a certain point of view about uh, Ukraine and its great struggle. Uh, to preserve its uh, life as an independent as an independent state, um, I want to move now to um, Juan Pablo Tello, who uh, I know Juan, you've had some technical problems staying with us, but it's wonderful to see you. Thank you. Um, you are not a stranger to uh, to this program. You've been on it before, and uh, you're going to be talking about Colombia. You are an attorney and policy analyst working passionately to improve governance and quality of life in your country. And a lot of that you are trying to do through infrastructure. So I want to welcome you back and also just uh, turn the floor over to you, but just note that um, for decades, uh, violence has kind of overshadowed anything that might be done or uh, called progress in Colombia. We had a peace process and now um, it's this, the state of that is, is fragile. So can you just, as you and the president, Ivan Duque, has sought to suspend election guarantees as one of the latest assaults on the country's constitution and political system. So can you just give us uh, an update on what is happening right now in uh, Colombia and how your aspirations for making Colombia a better place through um, infrastructure development can, can prosper with this pressure on the political system in the country. So over to you, Juan. Hi, Pamela, and hi to everyone on the panel. It's a pleasure to be again with all of you here discussing such interesting topics. I'm sorry for the technical issues I was having. So I think we can divide your question into different parts. The first one is addressing violence and the peace process. And the second one is how Colombia has been moving forward from my perspective into building a democracy. And that's, that's a point I want to reference in my statement. And it's the fact that we can discuss a lot about what is, what isn't democracy, what happens when we don't have democracy, just as Carl mentioned. But how do we get there? How do we actually develop a country and make it a democratic republic that works and serves the interest of its people, right? So uh, the first part is, as you know, Colombia is a big state. It's twice the size of Texas. And violence has pestered most of Colombian history through 2000 years. If we want to go into a fast look and a fast review of 
what happened. It's just a lot of geographical isolation. The state has never had the capacity to reach all the corners of the country. And this has mean, this means different problems through, throughout history. The most recent ones, narco-traffic, which most of the people around the world is, is aware of when they think about Colombia. And then we have the peace process that tried to address one of the main and most important rebel groups and terrorist groups that were operating in Colombia, which was FARC-EP. As you just mentioned, Pamela, recently the peace process is in a fragile state. The government has been very vocal about its uh, about that it does not agree with how it was negotiated and agreed. But instead of thinking in the wrong part of this, I, I, I choose to believe in hope. And I choose, I choose to believe that there's a possibility of change and the fact that peace is a better business for everyone. So the state of the art right now is we're currently facing presidential elections in a few months, if not a month from now. And the country is divided, just as morals, most of the world we have seen the extremes getting to rise again, right? So we have the extreme left trying to take over the country and selling a message that everything has failed in the past 20 years, which is not true. Of course, there have been a lot of mistakes, especially when facing these terrorist groups, but Colombians, the, the standard of living, of living of Colombians has improved dramatically in the last 25 years. So that's something we have to acknowledge, although there's an issue and it's inequality and we have to address it. And that's precisely the point that I wanna address today. And is how do we address those gaps through infrastructure to build democracy? So as a Latin America, as a Latin American for me, it's really interesting to see how other countries always set the democratic debates around different topics that are important. Gender, how do we address more equality things? But when it comes down to Latin America, at least my interpretation is let's go back to basics. If we want democracy, we need services. If you want democracy, you need roads, you need pipelines, and you need education, especially in these countries that are huge in a geographic, um, in a geographic sense. So when it goes back to building democracy in the past 20 years, I think the infrastructure changes that, has been, that have been promoted in the country are addressing that issue and are making Colombia a safer, peaceful and more competitive country. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Juan. And I do like, uh, it's interesting to hear you sound a note of optimism when the things that I was reading about Colombia um, as I prepared to, for this were not terribly optimistic, but that uh, you're, you firmly believe that it's possible um, to make some progress in spite of um, the challenges. Um, how do you see, you know, when you talk about those areas of the country, again, I, I'm interested in this issue of how people feel democracy. For those people who are living in the areas that the government has had the greatest struggle in reaching, what do you think are the next two or three things that those people really want in order for, for them to feel that democracy is real? So the first thing, Pamela, I would say security. It's, it's a debate and it's an issue that Colombians in the past five years have overlooked, but it, it still needs to be addressed and it still needs to be talked about. Security was for almost 40 or 30 years, the most important budget in Colombia's agenda. And since the peace process, talks about security have been diminishing dramatically because there's political interest in selling Colombia as a peaceful place, which it has improved dramatically. Then again, I repeat that, but if you ask someone that lives in the outskirts of the country where there's no light, there's no pipelines, there's anything else, but you have para states and or criminal organizations that actually govern those territories, they would like security. That's the first thing. They would like to feel the state present being there because otherwise what happens is those groups are the ones that provide that service to the people. So I will go to first security then communication. Colombia is a country that is geographically isolated because we have three different mountain ranges that cross our country, rivers, the Amazon, deserts. You need to communicate these people with the rest of the country for them to connect 
with the state and with the productivity of, of, the, of the country itself. And finally, I'll say opportunities. I think the biggest issue that Latin Americans have to address is inequality. And you don't battle inequality with guns, you battle inequality with education and with opportunities. Well, thank you very much, Juan. Um, I think it's, it's great that we are kind of ending on uh, the whole uh, series of presentations uh, with, with those issues that you've just articulated, because I think we can see pieces of those issues in many, many different, uh, many different countries. Well, we're going to uh, move where I can't believe we are almost at the end of our time. We only have about 15 minutes left. And each of you was to have two minutes left to um, just kind of wrap up if there was anything that you wanted to, stay, to say. So starting, and I'm going to have to be quite a disciplinarian about this. Um, I'm gonna give each of you just uh, probably a minute and a half uh, to speak just so we can make sure that we have a proper closeout um, and knowing that there's going to be a little overage. So with that, let me move to Carl and just ask you um, after you've heard everything, um, kind of what's on, what's on your mind, Carl? And what are you thinking about? Particularly as you, you sort of laid out this idea of the Chinese uh, paper and Gilbert saying that this, his country was one where people might be thinking uh, about the future in this. Can you just kind of wrap up for us? Real quickly, I think that, uh, you know, China, I think, sees, again, democracy as a process of aggregating political will. And I think what, what we're hearing from the rest of the world and what China is perceiving is that what is really important about democracy is unified action, is being able to act as a state to satisfy human needs. And I think that's where, that's where it is attractive to other people when they look at the ability of China to actually aggregate that will, not on the front end, but on the back end through their, their feedback and their consultation mechanisms. That's the argument I think that China's trying to make. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. You used a lot less than two minutes. I guess um, the, the question would be, well, again, just what kind of democracy is it if everything is aggregated and we're talking about unified action? I know our own president talks a lot about um, unity and wanting to have it, but at the same time, we have this issue of voice some of the issues that some of our other panelists uh, have mentioned. And I don't know that there's really time, but I would certainly be interested in your views about how the, the, the Chinese government would deal with this issue of voice. Um, so far, it's the Communist Party that is the only voice uh, for, for China. Uh, but but it has a very famous I'm sorry, dissonance. Pamela. I'm sorry, Pamela, you're missing my point. Is no, China, I'm not missing is your China's, point. I'm just asking you to articulate well, what okay, the Chinese but China, are saying. But China is exactly doing that through their consultation mechanisms and their feedback mechanisms. That's the point I'm trying to make to you. They're not just ignoring that voice. They're saying, this is the proposal. Now here, you accept it because this is what we're going to do. And we're going to off, offer you the opportunity to give us feedback on it. So they're not ignoring it. They're just treating it from a different end of the spectrum. Okay, well, I would say that if they're the agenda setters and they're the only ones who can really speak and they're asking you what, what they want you to tell them about with respect to one question, um, then I would say that that's not necessarily um, anything that we would recognize as democracy. But I do, I do take your point. Well, we will move on now to Rupmati uh, for your two minutes. Please, uh, please, why don't you get started and let us know what's on your mind. Amazing views by everybody on the panel. And it's thrilling to know that everybody faces uh, difficult situations in each, uh, each country. But I would say that uh, democracy has to be inclusive and it is unique uh, for each country and what works can be termed as democracy if it brings in the will of the people or it brings in development for the people. So uh, uh, having uh, concrete uh, guidelines for democracy uh, would, uh, would rather be uh, more um, you know, compartmentalizing uh, unique experiments which are happening uh, country by country, case by case. So what works for a country in its development, in its, uh, in its international relations, in its internal development, I think that is democracy, uh, if we can uh, bring it to that. Uh, and India has been a successful democracy because for over seven decades, we have built successful um, infrastructure from being a colonial country. Even our, even our independence was uh, 
uh, fought on democratic grounds. We never used violence. It was uh, on the uh, on the uh, tenets of uh, justice. You know, we 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 um, requested for it rather than we waited for it. So um, democracy has been an uh, ongoing uh, experiment with our nation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, there's no question that you're a very, very, as I said earlier, a full-throated advocate for uh, democracy in India. I know poverty is a challenge for India, equality, many, many issues, but as, as uh, Juan said, it's uh, something that has to be built over time. So thank you very much for giving us um, your view about um, India and um, democracy. Um, Yes, so now what I think we'd like to do, I'm trying to think of who was third. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> um, the next person I'd like to have um, speak is uh, Gilbert. Why don't you speak to us for a couple of minutes? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Pamela. I, I think for me, um, uh, the, the, the kind of the, the futuristic thinking for, for East Africa and for Uganda is to kind of reflect on the question of the bit of for the people. Can, uh, uh, can, we, can we forge a way that looks at the aggregate experiences of, you know, um, uh, of, of, of the different peoples of, 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 of Uganda, of the region, and, and see we've been through conflict, we've, we've had war, what does it mean? And I think uh, when Pablo said it uh, very well, like, can we have the service provision? Can the roads be there? Can, you know, can, can we have security? Can we be able to communicate? Because we, we, we are talking now about uh, um, uh, a new breed of youth who are thinking about democracy and are not afraid and are saying, okay, we're not afraid of conflict now because we've had relative stability, but where are the services to go with that? So we need to, to have a for the people kind of uh, democracy and demonstrate that. And part of modeling that would be a peaceful transition and you know, uh, for Uganda, uh, uh, but also within the region. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, thank you very much. It's a big region, has lots of issues. Uh, and as you said, it's uh, struggling with basic security. So that's, that's definitely a challenge. Um, why don't we move now to the Middle East and ask uh, Elsa to give her closing uh, comments. Um, to me, in order to establish democracy in the Middle East and North Africa, it is necessary that the civilians um, try to unify and put hate aside to reach the, the one and only goal, which is peace and stability. And I think that religion must be separated from politics in order to, to reach that goal. Um, Elsa, that's, that's a fascinating point of view, especially in the Middle East where religion is so much a part of, of everything. Do you, are you hopeful that it is possible to do that? especially in Lebanon? You know, I think it is really hard because uh, first, all the governments are corrupt almost in the Middle East and North Africa, which makes things even more difficult. We are dealing with the majority is like poor, pe or like poor, poor people. They need money and those governments try to like to, to keep them cal calm by giving them like uh, some help for the end of the month, stuff like that. So that's why it's really hard for those people to overcome this kind of thinking and unite and fight for the same cause. Yes, yes, it's very tough. That's uh, absolutely for sure. Um, thank you very much though for your, for your comments and for that aspiration. Um, why don't we move thank now you. to... Uh, Carl Ackerman, and why don't you give us uh, your closing thoughts about uh, democracy after you've already left us with poetry. Um, what more would you like to add? Um, very simple, and I want to leave the rest to, um, um, to, to, to uh, one of my great colleagues. But um, uh, the first thing I want to say is that my two of my students, um, Robert and Brian, are on this call, uh, are on this webinar. 
And uh, they were with me when we saw the Soviet Union fall in August of 1991, which was a, a glorious day for me because I believe in representative democracy. Um, I want to say one thing about democratic centralism that you see in Marxist Leninist governments. Uh, having lived in the former Soviet Union and also uh, Havana, Cuba, um, there are good things about people getting the basic ingredients of life, but it, they both were totalitarian regimes. So as Bob Dylan might say, there was no democracy at all. Um, but my final comments are for the entire group, and it's a quote from Red Fay, who was the undersecretary of the Navy under John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and he talked about the pleasure of his company. I just want to say to all of my colleagues, it's the pleasure of your company. Thank you all. Well, that's, uh, that's very, very generous, uh, generous of you, Carl, and I'm glad that you're one of your uh, students is on the call. In fact, we have almost 70 guests on uh, the program, so I'm appreciative of everyone um, being here. Um, I'm gonna try to get to at least one question, but first I wanna go and give um, Juan Pablo Otello a chance to give uh, his closing comments. So uh, Juan, over to you. Thanks, Pamela. I think my reflection for the end of the panel would be, let's keep building what whatever democracy means to us, right? We have seen that throughout the different places and throughout the different places where the panelists are set and are sitting at now today. We have different interpretations, different challenges, but definitely this, I think these decades to come are going to be fundamental to protecting the rights that we have fought so hard to get. And it's an invitation to protect democracy in all its shapes and hopefully get a, a more equal and a happy word. I mean, this sounds a bit cheesy, but I think it's important to always remind ourselves that democracy is a fight and it's not something that we, got, we can take for granted. I think those are wonderful words. And we're actually a little bit um, ahead of time. And um, so uh, if anybody has something that they are burning to say that they didn't have a chance to say, now is your opportunity. I just like to observe as uh, the moderator that you all have very, very different uh, outlooks and, and points of views, but I do see this thread of hope running through a lot of what you're saying. I mean, some of you are working um, on or working in countries that have tremendous challenges. Um, Lebanon, um, Uganda, Colombia, um, even India, you know, it, it's as big as it is and as, as much as uh, it has changed in the last 70 years of its democracy, there are tremendous, tremendous challenges. And yet, I'm still hearing through most of what you're saying that there are great hopes that a system that is, uh, it's hard to believe that Abraham Lincoln has been alive in this program, but um, of, by, and for the people is what, what you see as an aspiration in spite of all the challenges that um, the countries are, are facing, whether those challenges have to do with uh, corruption, whether they have to do with uh, poverty, um, communication, basic security, as Juan said, all of those things are true. And yet, as we think about what would help us move forward across the world, for many, many people, uh, the idea of a democratic system that gives voice to people's aspirations, that gives people certain rights, that, pro that says that the expectation is that the state is there to work for the people. That is the whole idea of, um, of democracy. And yet, as, as Carl Baker has told us, there's a different conception, uh, not that the Chinese don't think that their conception of democracy is working for the people, but it's a very, very different, almost on its head conception of where the center of gravity lies, whether it should be with the people or with the state. And so uh, I think this is going to be something that uh, the world is, is going to be grappling with. We heard during the program lots of different um, conceptions, east, west, north, south, of how people are getting their information and making their decisions. We've also heard about um, how countries have to, or are choosing to perhaps be very bullish on the idea of democracy as is the case in India, and yet still make a, a very hard boiled decision about where its interests lie and choosing to side with a, an authoritarian government in the case of Russia, rather than um, uh, one that is aspiring to democracy because um, the, of the partnership that is of long standing. So I, you know, I understood that uh, very clearly as well. 
Um, one of the things that I want to take um, the uh, prerogative, I want to, I, I started with um, Madeleine Albright, and um, I'd like to um, end with, with her too. Um, and that is, she said, uh, I just want to close. Contrary to conventional wisdom, the momentum is not with the enemies of democracy. It's true in recent years that some authoritarians have grown stronger, but in many cases, they are now failing to deliver including in countries where people increasingly expect accountable leadership, even in the absence of democratic rule. This is a key point that few observers have yet grasped. Democracy is not a dying cause. In fact, it is poised for a comeback. That's the end of her quote. Um, it sounds to me like a lot of you uh, who are living in states with all mixed systems, democratic systems, more authoritarian ones, whatever. Um, but that sense of hope, that note of hope that she sounds uh, in an article that she wrote just a few weeks before she passed away shows that the hope for democracy is there. And I think we have heard that uh, from all of the panel members. So I would just like uh, on behalf of this whole panel to again thank uh, Jay Fidel for this think tech Hawaii program. I would like to thank each and every one of the panelists for taking time today to be with us, to share your views, to be courteous to one another, um, and to uh, thank our audience, which has been extremely uh, attentive. I'm sorry we were not able to get to all of your, your questions. Some of them were, were very good, but I hope that you found this um, panel to be useful. I know that um, I found it very interesting. And I wish all of you uh, good health and uh, perhaps there'll be some other time when we'll all have a chance to get together again and see what is happening since there are some democratic milestones that will be taking place in Africa. We heard about uh, the Kenyan elections in a couple of years um, with the elections in, in India, uh, in China with the Communist Party uh, meeting and many, many, many other opportunities for um, the citizens of the world, we hope, to have a chance to tell their leaders what they expect uh, through exercising the franchise. So I'm very hopeful about democracy myself. I put myself on the side uh, that uh, Madeleine Albright was on. And I, I thank again, each of you for your contributions and appreciate your aspirations for your country and all of us for the world. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye and aloha, mahalo. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.